In this video, we're going to be talking about tracing in equity. So we're following on from the previous video where we were talking about common law tracing to talk about the specific circumstances in which we can trace in equity. Okay, so if the claimant is able to establish that the property was transferred in breach of a fiduciary duty, which need not be fraudulent, they will be able to use equitable tracing. This allows the claim to trace it through mixed funds and to take the increase in value of any assets bought with the funds. However, this is also, it appears, available in common law tracing following the Court of Appeals judgment in FC Jones and Jones, as we saw in the previous video. So with equitable tracing, you can trace through mixed funds. And tracing in equity or equitable tracing is a is considerably more extensive. It's a considerably more extensive means of tracing property rights than that is available in the common law. So we've got equitable tracing, we've got common law tracing, and equitable tracing is a lot more powerful. Now, as will emerge, equitable tracing permits property rights to be traced into mixtures of property so that one of a number of different equitable remedies may be used to reconstitute the claimant's property rights. Okay, now the, fund will, the fundamental prerequisite for the bringing of an equitable claim is that the claimant must have had some equitable interest in the property which is to be traced before equity will entertain the claim. So that pre-existing equitable interest may be a beneficial interest under an express um, or constructive trust. Now, as discussed, it is important to remember that this is a two-stage process. The first stage is for the detective work of the tracing process to be carried out so that the claimant is able to identify the property which stands as a substitute for her original property and against which she therefore wishes to bring her claim. The second stage, having traced the property, is to identify which equitable remedy should be imposed over that property. Now, the main advantage of equitable tracing is that property may be traced through mixed funds. There are rules depending on the circumstances, whether the money has been mixed with funds of the person in breach of the fiduciary relationship or with funds belonging to an innocent third party. And this is something we're going to be looking at over the next couple of videos too. Equity can trace money through electronic fund transfers, whereas common law cannot as well. And so you can see that case from Agip and Jackson, which we saw in the previous video. Now, in order to trace an equity, there are three main requirements. The claim must be based on a pre-existing fiduciary relationship. So someone in a fiduciary relationship must have misappropriated the property. It is a prerequisite for an equitable tracing claim that the claimant had some equitable interest in the original property or that the person who transferred the property away had some fiduciary uh, relationship to the claimant, such as being a trustee. Therefore, before starting an equitable tracing claim, one must ensure that there is a pre-existing equitable interest. The second requirement then is that property must be in a traceable form. So there must be some sort of property you can attach it to. And thirdly, it must be equitable to trace. And we have this case here of Hallett. So um, Natch Bull and Hallett from 1879. And in this case, Hallett was a solicitor and he sold some property held on trust. And he paid those pro the proceeds of that sale into his own bank account and then he died. So the question is, and the question was in this particular case, who owns the proceeds of sale here? And the case clearly stated the requirements needed in order to trace in equity. So it's these three requirements. The claim must be based on a pre-existing fiduciary relationship, the property must be in a traceable form, and it must be equitable to trace. The remedy in equity is not confined to claims between trustees and beneficiaries. So this case decided that the remedy was not restricted to such a case, but was available against other fiduciaries. Now, in the High Court, Judge Fry was concerned whether the solicitor, Hallett, 
had a fiduciary relationship, given he held as a bailee and not a trust, um, like as a trustee, strictly speaking. So in this specific case, Hallett wasn't really a trustee, he was more of a bailey. And in the Court of Appeal, so moving on from the High Court, Lord Jessel held that there was a fiduciary relationship and the proceeds of the sale of the bonds, which were wrongly sold by Hallett and put into his bank account, could be traced. So it was held where a trustee mixes trust money with his or her own money in a bank account and then withdraws that money from the account. It is assumed that the trustee first took out his or her own money rather than the money belonging to a trust beneficiary. Okay, so that's a little case that sort of I like to talk about when I first talk about um, equitable tracing. But let's look at a couple more cases now. We've got this case of Sinclair from 1914, and this is a very contentious case, and it's quite hard to work out exactly what it means because, you know, the judgments aren't consistent and the fact that there is no clear ratio led to uh, the case being overruled in the case of Islington in 1996. So in this case, the building society started operating as a bank, that is taking deposits and giving loans other than for the purposes of allowing its members to buy houses. Now, the banking business was held to be ultra vera's and contracts entered into were void for illegality. When the society went into liquidation, the question arose as to the distribution of assets. So this building society took money from, mem uh, from its members and led it to other members so that they could buy houses. The building society forgot that they were only to lend money on security for a mortgage and starting, started to lend money ultra vires, that is outside of its powers. So all these loan contracts were held to be void for illegality. When the society then went into liquidation, it had some assets, and the question was, who do those assets belong to? In other words, the building society became insolvent, and the question arose as to how to divide up those assets. So was it the building society in which the asset would then form part of their estate in bankruptcy, or did the assets belong to the depositors? And the court eventually held that the money could be traced in equity by the creditors. Okay, we've also got this case of Diplock from 1948, and this case arose from the earlier House of Lords case of Reed Block, Chichester, Diocesan Fund and Simpson from 1944, in which it was held that the bequest for charitable or benevolent objects failed as a purpose trust. The bequests were held on resulting trust for the residuary beneficiaries. Now, by the time this verdict was reached, some £250,000 had been distributed to 139 charities. The second case was brought to determine whether and how the money could be recovered. Now, here, so he wanted to leave some money to charity, essentially, and he left it on trust to apply to such charitable or benevolent objects, uh, which, in you know, their complete discretion, can choose. However, you cannot do that. It must be exclusively charitable. And if it is not exclusively charitable, then unfortunately it is a non-charitable purpose trust and the law will not generally uphold a non-charitable purpose trust. So in other words, it was void on the basis that its charitable purpose had failed. So the trust failed. And as the trust failed, it is held on a resulting trust for the settler. So Mr. Diplock here. As Mr. Diplock was dead, it became part of his residual estate. So the residual beneficiaries brought an action against the executors and trustees of the will trust. So in this uh, particular case, Mr. Diplock left a large sum of money and in acting in good faith, um, the settlers and trustees had already distributed a lot of the money to the 139 different charities. 
one of the residual beneficiaries challenged the distribution of money by the settlers in Reed Diplock, Chichester Diocesan Fund and Simpson from 1944. And the court held that the money was held on a resulting trust for the residuary beneficiaries. At which point, one of the trustees said that there is no money and that they had given it all away. But as the trust was invalid, the trustees giving away the money was a breach of trust. Therefore, equitable tracing is available. So the residuary beneficiaries bring another action, which also gets to the House of Lords, although the Court of Appeal case here is more important, to find out how much money they can take from the charities. Now, the easy option was that those charities that were on notice that there was a breach of trust were fully liable for all of the money. But what about those charities that had accepted the money in good faith and spent it for themselves? Now, if they reasonably think, you know, it is their, you know, the charity's property, should they be able to keep it? And the court held that they could not. The charities were nevertheless subject to the rights of the residuary beneficiaries to trace after the money in equity, even though they had not themselves acted unconscionably. The beneficiary's property rights were held to bind even volunteers, provided that as a result of what has gone before, some equitable proprietary interest has been created and attaches to the property um, in the hands of the volunteer. Okay, Therefore, uh, it would not matter that the ultimate recipients were innocent of any breach of trust, provided that there had been some preceding breach of an equitable duty by someone else. And this Court of Appeal case in Ray Diplock was appealed to the House of Lords in Ministry of Health versus Simpson. And in the House of Lords judgment, Lord Simmons, with whom the other Lords agreed, described the judgment of the Court of Appeal as unimpeachable. Now, Previous cases of breach of trust or fiduciary duty, such as Hallett's estate, had considered the position of property held by the person in breach of trust. Now, in that case, the trustee himself had breached the trust by treating the property as his own and mixing it with his own money. The thing with Inri Diplock is that in all previous cases, it looked at whether the trustee was still in possession of the property. So in other words, it took the property um, sorry, t it had taken the property for their own use um, and they had mixed it in with their own property. But this is a different situation and here the property was no longer in the hands of the trustee but in the hands of a third party. Following the case of Sinclair, the Court of Appeal held that in our judgment it must be the principle clearly indicated by Lord Parker that equity may operate on the conscience, not merely of those who acquire a legal title in breach of some trust, express or constructive, or of some other fiduciary obligation, but of volunteers, provided that as a result of what has gone before, some equitable proprietary interest has been created and attaches to the property in the hands of the volunteer. Okay, so what Lord Green is saying here is that equity operates not only on those that acquire property through their own breach of trust, but also in the hands of people who are volunteers. So equity can follow property into the hands of people who do not know that there has been a breach of trust. In other words, innocent volunteers. Now, you may find this a little bit difficult to square with the ideas of knowledge and conscience, and indeed, in a way, it is difficult to square with the ideas of knowledge and conscience. But this is a proprietary claim which attaches to the property and it's not a personal claim against the volunteer themselves. So what emerges from the dicta of the court then is that they will seek to protect the beneficiary under the original fiduciary duty rather than allow the subsequent innocent volunteer to retain any rights in the windfall which he has received. So this case extends the remedy 
into cases where the property has ended up in the hands of an innocent third party. And there are two main circumstances um, where the property ha uh, remains in the hands of the defaulting trustee or fiduciary and where the property has passed into the hands of the third party. So these are the two particular scenarios that I want to look at in more depth in the next two videos, okay, where the property remains in the hands of the fiduciary and that is used for their own personal use. So in particular, we're going to look at cases where the the money has become mixed or the properties become mixed with their own property and also where the property passes into the hands of a third party. So as I say, we're going to look at those two particular circumstances in more depth in the next two videos. But this uh, video should have given you quite a nice little introduction into equitable tracing and how it does slightly differ or quite a lot differ from common law tracing. But if you have any questions at all about this particular video, then please do leave a comment below and I'll get straight back to you. And if you enjoyed the video, then make sure you give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much for watching.